welcome everyone and uh, thank you all for joining us once again on our webinar series where we bring industry experts to give us invaluable insights and wisdom on various topics that are related to real estate investing uh for those of you that do not know my name is Sohel Hassan and I'm the managing partner at market capital a private equity real estate company that's based out of headquartered out of Houston Texas and what an honor it is for me today to host a discussion between the chairman of Market Space Capital, Dr. Masaki Oishi, and of course, our esteemed guest for this evening, a dear family friend and a very successful multifamily owner and turnaround expert, Dr. Furkan Kulkan, the owner of Kulkan Capital. And as the only one here not holding a doctorate, let me tell you what a pleasure it is for me to be hosting tonight's discussion as I have deep respect and admiration for you both. Dr. Kokan's success is truly an amazing story, and he really is the epitome of the American dream. Uh, and this is really the reason why we wanted to feature him as our guest for the webinar this evening. He currently manages around 7,500 units in the Houston area and has consistently grown his portfolio at a minimum of 25% per year. But what's even more interesting is the way that he's done it. Dr. Kokan has achieved success in an asset class that is often forgotten or ignored, class C and D assets. And tonight we intend to take a deep dive into how these assets started, the success and lessons he has learned in completing over 90 transactions and what he's looking to accomplish in the coming years. And of course, we're also joined by my business partner and friend, Dr. Masaki Oishi, who currently serves as the chairman of Market Space Capital and he's also the recent uh, he's also the recent author of a newly published book, Prescribing Real Estate: A Doctor's Guide to Investing in Real Estate. I'd like to welcome you both. And to begin, I'd like for you to uh, go into why and how you got into investing in real estate, and additionally to talk about the first deal that you specifically had and kind of what got you started investing in, in multifamily particular. Dr. Well, Oishi, maybe you can go first. Thank you, Sohel. I really appreciate the introduction. And of course, I'm honored to share the stage with, with Dr. Kalkan. He's uh, just a tremendous uh, individual and uh, accomplished uh, person. Of course, uh, as a real estate investor, uh, he has tremendous experience and knowledge in the field. Uh, my own uh, experience uh, started perhaps uh, when I was about 15 years old. Uh, you know, my parents moved to this country in the 1960s and uh, they didn't speak much English. So uh, when they started investing in real estate, naturally it uh, fell upon me, their eldest uh, son, <laughs> to do things like make sure the rents got collected and that the insurance and real estate uh, taxes got paid and you know, to manage uh, all the uh, properties. So at the time, I didn't think it was such a, a great experience, but I think now that I look back on it, uh, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to uh, you know, get exposed to that kind of, of uh, uh, management uh, task at a young age. Um, you know, so over the years, I've always thought about uh, real estate differently, uh, I guess, and uh, even as a physician, uh, I kept my eye on the real estate market as well as you know, other investments. Uh, I think a lot of physicians are, you know, of course, cognizant. They understand that real estate is a very uh, a strong uh, asset class uh, that they should uh, probably diversify from other assets into real estate uh, now more so than ever. Uh, but uh, a lot of uh, doctors really don't know where to start. And I think that was one of the, uh, imp that really provided the impetus for me to reach out to more physicians and of course, to write uh, prescribing real estate, which you know, quite frankly, I think uh, the, the message really applies to not just to doctors, but any uh, professional who of course is good at what they do uh, but doesn't necessarily have the time to uh, go out there and have their own uh, wealth building strategy. 
So that's kind of in a nutshell where I'm coming from. Um, I think your experience may differ, Sohel, and of course, uh, Dr. Kalkan, but I think we all share uh, a love and a passion for a real estate investment. Absolutely. And thank you, Dr. Oishi. We appreciate your, your candid feedback there. So Dr. Kalkan, let's go to you. If you don't mind telling us kind of a little bit about your background and giving us an introduction of yourself, as well as how you kind of got started into investing in multifamily real estate. I was born in Turkey and uh, I got my uh, BS degree in Turkey and uh, I came to United States for MS and PhD uh, degrees and uh, Texas A&M is the best in my area, job six. Uh, that's why I came to uh, college station and starting real estate is, you know, kind of the accidental. Uh, when I came to United States, southern part of the United States was having the huge crisis, oil crisis. Oil prices dropped uh, almost uh, $3 per barrel. And then lots of the people left uh, Texas and moved to other states. And the uh, uh, banks repossessed uh, those uh, houses, you know. I think that around 500 or 600,000 people left Texas during those bad times. And uh, what happened that banks uh, collapsed when they, so many people didn't pay the mortgage, banks collapsed. And government wanted to uh, solve this problem. And what happened that they created the Resolution Trust Corporation. Basically, that corporation did it. Everybody who is renting, they get the chance to buy the uh, wherever they are living. And they come to me, they all told me that I was living in a duplex. Uh, if you would like to buy this duplex, you need to go to auction. And in that auction, uh, governments will uh, make the loan process easier, okay? And, you know, I, it was the first time in my life I was in an auction. There were more than a thousand people and they were auctioning to like around 100, 125 uh, houses, duplexes. And I was the lucky one. I bought the uh, duplex I was living in and I saw that real estate is very good. And then immediately I started to think about that. How can I buy more? That time I was uh, uh, studying, you know, at the same time I was working with the 1992 money, you know, I was making monthly thousand dollars and first two duplexes I bought with the, uh, this uh, phenomena, uh, we can call the Resolution Trust Corporation uh, stuff and suddenly, you know, I was making more than a thousand dollars. I said, look, I love to buy the, as many as duplex possible. <laughs> and then, since 1992, I kept buying and I keep growing. And uh, right now, I have 7,500 uh, units, and it is very good career. Of course, after I started, I learned. I compare the real estate with the other investment vehicles. And if you look at the Forbes 500 list on those years, I'm not sure this year, but. Uh, if you look at that, how the people get, uh, get rich, uh, top 500 people, and the, the biggest group is real estate. Consistently, real estate beats the high tech and medical areas and oil sectors. Uh, people, more people get billionaire from the real estate than the in other sectors. Means is that real estate, investing in real estate is very fruitful industry. And since I started, I love it. And uh, it is better vehicle than the other uh, investments because there is a consistency. You can earn consistently better return than the other investments. You know, if I look at the last 30 years of the return of the, all the big stock investors you are thinking, from the uh, Ackerman to uh, Warren Buffett, all of them you look at. Real estate beats the, or at least my returns beats the, their returns. It is great thing, and at the same time, the way we do the real estate, the neighborhoods we go, we revitalize, we change the neighborhood, we have the good feeling what we are doing. At the same time, we get 
very good returns. Amazing. Fantastic. Thank you. And I know, Dr. Kulkan, that you have really have specialized in, a, in an asset class, as I mentioned earlier, that is often overlooked, right? And uh, most people tend to stay away from those asset classes, uh, those class C and D asset classes. Can you tell us a little bit about your business model and kind of what your experience has been with these asset classes? The thing is, you know, when I started the real estate, you know, it was quite different than the today's environment. Right now, today you can just enter the computer, you can see the, all the properties for sale. You know, those times, look, computer was, internet wasn't existed, but by the way, almost wasn't existed. You know, you have to, and getting the loans were much more difficult than the, these times. And I wanted to get the best returns. To be able to get the, get the best returns, I chose the uh, cheapest properties in the city. Whatever the, those cheapest, I bought it without thinking very much uh, uh, consequences. And all I my focus was to getting the best return I can get it, and the same money from the, my return and buy the more. I want to expand as much as I expand, and of course I invested. Uh, very bad neighborhoods, very tough neighborhoods. And those times, you know, naturally, it never scared me. I was perfectly okay. And then I specialized, we call the class D properties. Yeah. There are four class of the real estate, A, B, C, D. Those are completely different than the each other. You know, issue is, although you can call it, you might think that you know ABC is very close to each other. Class D is completely different than the class C. You know, class A and class B. Let me go over a little bit what those classes means. You know, class A generally very well kept, very well built uh, apartments. Generally, uh, people with the high income rents from those places, and their services are perfect. They are designed to book properties in the right location and the, everything is perfect for them. And their rents generally per square feet more than $2. It can go $3, even more. It can, I have seen that even it's going to $5. Those are the A-class properties. A-class properties, it looks good because it is relatively new. It doesn't bring any problem. And the tenants always pay the rent on time. And almost 100% uh, of the tenants pay the in first three days of every rent, all their rents. It works perfectly. But the A class, if everything works perfectly, means is that your return is very low. You can make very low return. And the uh, big institutions invest the A class. You know, for them, 5% is good enough, 5% return. The, you know, uh, A class, you cannot find the, like 10%, uh, 15% returns. No, A class is special. B class is a little bit older, but at the same time, there might be proper apartment complexes built new, but we cannot call them A classes because they don't have enough amenities. You know, you have to have the very good pool, you have to have the good uh, jacuzzi and that kind of things for becoming the A class. B class, you know, amenities are lower, rents are lower, but generally we have the apartments. A and B, I don't invest. I don't go to those areas. C class properties are the properties we generally they are old, 30, 40, 50 years old, and they are they call the also workforce housing. Generally, people who are working with their hands and very low income people uh, uh, buy, low, lives in those apartments. Mm -hmm. Generally, they are uh, not in good neighborhoods of the city. Okay, G C and D is again the completely different properties. C class is brings lots of the repairs because people live in those properties. Uh, they are not well kept properties and they have lots of maintenance issues. But when it, those properties are not well, uh, well taken, 
they become the D class. D class is okay. Basically, the neighborhoods we don't go, we don't visit generally for people. And D class properties. To define the D class, I used a uh, very good uh, method where the pizza man doesn't deliver the pizza, FedEx doesn't print the, your mail, and bank doesn't want the loan money because uh, they are they might be controlled by the dangerous people that's the, my specialization i love to invest in d class apartments mm. and the, we buy them and we uh, renovate them and we uh, bring them to b minus or d class apartment complexes and our return d class as we are specializing always brings the good return and is not affected markets ups and the down it's the most consistent and the best investment tool only thing is to be able to invest d class you have to be specialized you have to know what you are doing very well understood and thank you for that feedback i really appreciate it those insights into uh why the class c and d apartments is, is very helpful to us uh, particularly understanding that there's less competition in those because the uh you know institutional investors typically don't like the risk uh that's associated with those projects um and as you alluded to dr kolkan i mean you know these class c and d apartments they really are kind of the most recession proof in terms of you know their ability to you know there's nowhere that can downgrade even further right so as a result this really allows us to be able to make a um, impact in the local community because any of these changes that you make are making are obviously very you know uh, sought after and welcomed uh, in the area and then one of the things that you didn't touch upon here that I think is worth noting is that in these class C and D apartments, you're also potentially the beneficiary of government grants and programs that also come from this as well. So there's a, a multitude of, of benefits that come from these types of investments, although typically they are not the most attractive and appealing investments that investors go after. Is that correct? The thing is, government uh, creates very nice programs. There is a community reinvestment act program. Government tells the banks, if you loan class D property neighborhoods, I will uh, give you generous uh, credit. Also, if you uh, give the uh, invest on those, pro if you don't invest, uh, if you don't loan the uh, class D properties, I'm going to find you. Still, banks don't want to loan class d properties and another thing is uh government has two agencies Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac they are mandated to loan class d neighborhoods they are mandated but still they don't loan class d the reason is this when the bank loans money if the proper if the uh, operator doesn't uh function very well if it doesn't pay the its mortgage bank needs to take it repossess it back bank doesn't want to go those neighborhoods but yeah. the, if you are like me 20 30 29 years proven himself that only invest in the d class every property touch he return and he made a great return yes they say that yeah we will uh, uh, give you uh, credit I can, for example, uh, last one year, it was very tough uh, to get credit for any type of the properties. I borrowed over $80 million in this January. Uh, the reason is when the banks look at the person, operator, that they think that you have the extremely good track record and you did the wonderful uh, returns and they become okay. Okay, uh, this person can succeed. Uh, regardless of the government's efforts, uh, we need to be able to tell the other people that investing D class is we need to educate the people that 
is the best investment tools you can make the better returns than the Warren Buffett, which is the best investor in the stock market. Yeah. And uh, as long as, is it difficult to invest, you know, even if you get the loan? Look, in, in A class, everybody wants to go to A class, returns are very low. Yes. Okay, apartment is good and you are, you are getting to 5%. For 5%, I don't even look at. You know, even the best problem, I don't really care about it. You know, it has to be 20 or above percent return. The last 20 years, 28 years, did I make ever less than 20% return? Any single property I did. No, consistently, I am doing the more than 25% return. And uh, what, what about the, let's compare the, this one uh, with the uh, other investment tools, you know. What happens to... Uh, you know, stock market, every day you goes up, down, and up. These neighborhoods are already forgotten. Nobody cared about them. And you go there, whether the stock market goes up or down, or whether there is a recession or not recession, whether there is a COVID or not COVID, okay, I get a good return constantly because there are the lots, there is very big demand for housing, but the housing should be clean, quiet, safe neighborhood. Everybody wants to secure it. When you buy the bad neighborhood apartments and you turn them the good neighborhoods, you know, people move in there and you get the wonderful returns. Understood. And, and we get that, you know, these Class C and D properties, they can produce amazing results when operated correctly. But I think, you know, a lot of questions that not only we, but also our investors have is, how do these assets perform during COVID or any other financial crisis, right? And I think most people have the perception that most of the tenants for these assets are in those service-oriented business, right? Those who were impacted the hardest from the pandemic. So maybe you can t talk to us a little bit about what your experience has been and maybe touching upon, uh, you know, how it, the financial downturns, um, how you've been able to respond to those those issues? Since I started real estate, you know, first of all, I started real estate during the recession time, 1992, there was a recession. Uh -huh. And then there became the 2001 crisis, you know, airplanes, New York hit the towers. Then 2009, uh, there was a big recession, a financial crisis. Then there's COVID crisis. You see, every crisis, we are doing much better than the regular times. You know, the thing is that COVID hit, this is it. Hopefully this year, we will do much better than we ever done during the last 28 years. When the crisis hit, when the crisis hit, uh, the apartment complexes or managers who prepared well they do better than the others. For example, how do we do better? You know, when the COVID crisis hit, most of the apartment complexes didn't open the office. What we did, we opened all the offices. We gave this hand sanitizer all of our tenants. We gave the mask to all of our tenants. But when they couldn't uh, pay their rent, we sit down and we filed their application for assistance. But the end result is this. Uh, 2020 was the best year in real estate we ever had. And 2021 still it is continuing. This year will be the second or best year. And this year we will grow uh, much more than we used to grow. Generally, our company is growing 20-25% annually. This year, most probably, we will grow 40-50%. The reason is when the crisis hits, you know, everybody just to worry about, we take the, our precautions. When you are operating D-class apartment complexes, when you are going to those tough neighborhoods, you are already prepared for everything. Everything possible can think can go wrong. We are already prepared. So when the actual something happens, for us, there is no difference. Only thing is it affects the others badly, not to us. You know, at the end of it, I would say that this is the 2021 
will be the best years in our uh, real estate history. In fact, this January, we closed 1,448 units. I think that we are the only company in Houston right now uh, with the bank financing uh, growing this much. That's fantastic. And, and again, I think this goes to the point that you made in terms of being able to manage these types and, and, and being an efficient operator uh, during these times of crisis. And like you said, it really creates opportunities for people who are following closely. So Dr. Kokan, you know, we've been talking about this in a very abstract form, you know, your ability to turn around these properties, but I'd like to take a moment to take a deeper dive, right? And getting into a few case studies that our audience, uh, which allows our audience to get a better understanding of what you've been able to accomplish. And once we've been able to understand that, I'd like to take a deeper dive into exactly how you've been able to accomplish that. So if you don't mind, we'll start with a, a few case studies. We mentioned the Mira Vista and the La Asensia apartments. What conditions were these assets in before you took over? And what did you do exactly to stabilize them? And maybe you can give us an example of, or kind of tell us where they're at now. Um, Mira Vista apartments, uh, in fact, uh, I learned about this apartment complex. I bought the big apartment complex, 886 unit, Palm Beach apartments in one neighborhood, yeah, the Grease Point neighborhood. Mira Vista is located in the same neighborhood. One day I was working in my office, a lady came and he said, uh, are you Piaokan? I said, yes. And he just, she just dropped the keys and said that these are the uh, keys of the, my apartment complex, you go ahead and manage. I said, ma'am, uh, excuse me, I don't have management license for managing to some other people's properties. I manage only my own properties. And she said, okay, in that case, you buy this apartment. I'm tired of the sick of the, this apartment. Okay, okay, just calm down. And she said, I have a one hour. I'm leaving to Chicago, okay? And you have to manage this one. I don't know what good things about it. Make it shorter. And I went to uh, that apartment's office and there were the two gentlemen who met me in that office and they were clothes were like a ninjas you know and they had a gun in their uh, back of to their leg okay i'm very much familiar with the american police system i never see the gun on the back of the knee of the people and I started to talk to them. I said that, look, I met the owner and he told me to have uh, to manage. I'm going to manage. I want to, you know, uh, clean up this neighborhood. I, ha I heard about that this problem is in trouble. And the gentleman started to talking to me. And he said that he wants to do the same thing. And, you know, always the, my mind goes to gun. Why did he has a gun back to his knee. American police never carry the gun in the back of the knee. And his clothes are not the regular police uh, clothes. Okay, I said, have a seat then. Let's talk to the table about it. And we kept talking 50 minutes, 20 minutes. And he, they introduced themselves that, oh, they want to clean this neighborhood and other things. Well, there are many, many things I got my attention. They were, you know, uh, catching the, my attention. And suddenly, when they were sitting in the desk, uh, you know, they jumped and they left the office. Then police came. I said, oops. One group of the police came and uh, others are leaving. I thought that others were police too. And she, he asked me, police came and asked me, uh, where did they go? I said, who are they? I thought that they are officers too. No, 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 they are not officers, they are the drug dealers, and we are after them months and months, and even when you see them, you report to us. I said, come on, they are meeting with all the tenants, they have all the records of the tenants, you know, what kind of, you know, management here? Okay, make it a short, we bought that apartment complex, and uh, uh, 
we talked to all the tenants and we told them that we want to uh, not the crime in this neighborhood and if we see that any people uh, you know involving any activities criminal activities we will evict them and we did and uh, uh, there are the investors they buy and they change the class of the apartment complex they want to go from uh, work for housing to upper income levels we like to keep it the same level these are the okay poor people were living before poor people are living now but the issue is crime rate uh, dropped to more than 90 percent and uh, one day of course you know when i'm working uh, i always uh, meet with the officers they visit me and i hire them i have my own security company i have you know always uh, uh, contract the security companies. One day I was talking to uh, 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 constables and uh, they told, I asked them a question. I said, that in North, what is the most troubled apartment complex? What is the most troubled? And he says, La Asensia. And I said, what is wrong with the La Asensia? He said that it is, they are called the T means that three neighborhoods join in the one place and you can never solve this problem and there are the hotels in front of and they list the month to month and all criminals and i look at i asked them how many times 911 call was made and i remember 1400 times 1400 wow. times wow. means is that almost every day four times somebody's calling to emergency this apartment okay i said i'm going to buy that apartment and i'm going to turn around my philosophy is this only five percent of the people make the neighborhood bad look bad and if you management is not strong enough if the management let the things happen go out of the hand all neighborhoods become spoiled in one year we reduce the crime rate here more than let's say that in 18 months more than 95 percent in the la essentia la essentia many people try to buy they couldn't mind buy contract fell through so many times because they couldn't get finance even if they were to get finance they couldn't be able to straighten this apartment complex uh, both of the apartment complex noi net operating income increase more than doubled more than double more than double means is that you know roughly value is almost double both of the apartment complexes it is both of them very success story uh, i am thinking that miravista was the more the worst apartment complex grease point area the essentia is north of the grease point area they were the worst but now is both of them fully occupied and everybody pays their rent and children is able to play on the uh, apartment yards amazing amazing that, Thank that, you. Just congratulations Thank on your success literally taking a apartment complex uh and being able to turn around the, the numbers to this degree is just truly impressive and i i believe that you know this is due to your business model and your plan of being able to and it, if we go to the next screen you'll see that you know here is a rent roll essentially for one of your assets okay and you know it's beautiful to see because this really is such a great visual on what you've been able to accomplish so i'd like to take a moment to uh, detail this process here in your ability to, you know, create stabilization within the, the apartment complex. So here you'll see a rent roll analysis of a apartment complex that is owned within the Kulkan portfolio. You'll see that the purple indicates a non-paying tenant, where the red indicates a vacant tenant. So you can see that this is a very clear and abstract indication of the Kalkan business model in effect. You can see that it begins with 
the acquisition and there being a lot of purple or non-paying tenants. And as you can understand that, you know, Kokon is basically taking over an asset that is essentially non-performing, right? It has high economic vacancy, which obviously, as you can see, is indicated by the purple. The goal from taking over the asset from day one is to begin evicting all the non-paying uh, tenants and the career criminals, which you can see is all indicated in red to your graph to the left. And then finally, you can see where the business model starts to be implemented and to take effect, where you start to see in white there, where you have tenants that are paying rent on a consistent basis. So if you were just to see from a very abstract view in terms of its color coordination, you can see from the left where it goes from all purple to all red and then to all white. And really, this is a dramatic impact on the net operating income for this asset. And Dr. Kokan, if you don't mind, you know, walking us through a little bit of this graph, like I have here for our viewers, to help them understand your not only your ability to turn around these assets, but also how you're managing these assets on a monthly basis. The thing is. Thank you. Uh, here is the uh, graph of the one apartment complex. This is not unique. Every apartment complex is I buy. It's similar shape. Okay, tenants don't pay the rent, and landlord cannot pay the mortgage, and landlord doesn't have money uh, to buy the materials. And the issue is maintenance people are not paid very well. So maintenance people, even they want to fix it, they cannot fix anything because there is no material. And uh, if you look at the 2017 when I bought it, this uh, each row, each row here is the one uh, apartment number. And the 2017 when I bought the, and I closed the end of it, you know, uh, they were not collecting uh, almost any rent. And the uh, issue is there were the tenants, but tenants. Basically, no service is given, no hot water, and most of the air conditions are not working. Basically, deserted apartment complex. Okay, this is our cup of the tea. We have the team which is experienced and uh, very much knowledgeable about the, how to deal with the problem. And we have the contractor security company, and we say that we go to each unit and we talk to each tenant that. Look, things change. You have been living like this years and years. Okay, everything will change. Hot water will work every day. Everybody's air condition will work. No roof will leak. And uh, uh, you can continue. Every problem will be fixed. Okay, some people, uh, you look at the contracts. Oh boy, contracts uh, under somebody's name, but somebody else is living. Actually, there is no contract. You just ask them to move out. And if they are the career criminals, you ask them to straighten their uh, act or move out. And uh, some move out, uh, some, uh, you know, would like to uh, go to court. Okay, everything is perfect. But when we are starting here, this project, we don't see that, you know, or 90% or 80% doesn't pay rent or 80% vacant. We don't care about those things. We care about it. Okay, if we start in the beginning of the 2018, by the beginning of the 2019, in one year, we will fix the 90% of the problems. And uh, to be able to do one person to do this, you need a really good team. And especially, your managers, your maintenance people, your security company has to be experienced people, very much experienced people. Everybody should trust each other. And uh, uh, this is a success story. Uh, I can say that uh, more than 400% rent income increase in this property. Wow. Wow, that's amazing.
Am, am I reading this correctly, Dr. Kalkan? Because it looks like you, you accomplished this uh, this turnaround in in less than a, a year and a half. I mean, it looks like a, a you know a tremendous uh, increase in the number of rent paying tenants. Right around uh, I don't know uh, fifteen months. The issue is, let's say that this is 2017, 18. In fact, we are improving ourselves better and better all the time. Right now, our turnaround is almost uh, six to nine months oh, because wow. our team is increasing. Uh, we are becoming more and more professional. We are becoming more and more specialization, specializing on this area. In fact, uh, we bought the January one apartment complex in uh, Southeast Houston. It was 50% occupied and we bought, uh, you know, it was in the miserable shape. And we are thinking that we are uh, at the end of the, uh, May, it will be close to 100% occupy, occupancy. And those 50% occupied, but the issues, they were not rent paying once. Now issue is at the end of the May, we are hoping that in five months, we will make the entire apartment from uh, non-paying rent, high vacancy to everybody paying rent and the high occupancy. But to do this, you know, you have to, you know, we do the paint the outside, paint the insides and the change all the outside lights. You know, you go through the, uh, uh, system and you try to improve them. Uh, there are the, some things uh, in this property took us the much longer time than the uh, current uh, the way we are doing. And we think that in one year, maximum one year, we can turn around any property regardless of the, how bad shape they are. That's remarkable. Wow. Amazing. You know, we do have 250 maintenance people, you know, to handle the, to take it, uh, to take the every challenge we can face. Okay. Well, yeah, I'm sure that uh, some of our listeners, some of our audience uh, are very much interested now in class C and D properties. Uh, you know, I'm sure uh, you make it look easy, Dr. Kalkan, but um, you know, I think, as you said, it requires a bit of uh, management infrastructure and uh, resources in order to, to make these sort of dramatic changes happen. Yeah, absolutely. This is not uh, investing D class is not can be cannot be done as a side job. You have to, uh, you know, this is 365 days, 100 hours uh, per week work you can succeed at some kind of the very high determination and the very long hours. But this is the, I take the pride of what I am doing. And uh, uh, can you imagine that when the property is 70% vacant, regardless of the American economic condition, you have a niche area there. It is not the, the economy of the debt area is not the following economy of the United States. Regardless of the recession or good times, those areas always are in miserable shape until investor, one investor comes and turn around the whole neighborhood. But to be able to do that, you have to be specialized or you need to work with the specialized companies. You cannot say that, uh, first of all, for this kind of investment, you cannot say that, let me diversify, let me buy some B class, some D class. Look, D class is completely different category. You know, instead of the uh, diversification, you need to have laser sharp uh, focus on the, what you are doing. And your team needs to be exactly the same laser focus team it has to be. Fantastic. And Dr. Kalkan, if you see some of the items that we've listed here in terms of being able to implement that business model, I mean, it, it's very important, as Dr. Kalkan alluded to, to be you know focused on this asset class. It's very difficult if you're if you have class A, B, C, and D assets. It's it's important to be specialized in a certain asset class, and particularly because you know we know that it's difficult 
to get loans from banks. Uh, but if you're an experienced sponsor that's focused on these turnaround assets, then it's obviously you know simpler to be able to go through that process. Um, in addition to that, you know one of the things that he's mentioned about implementing through this turnaround process is 24-hour security with excellent insurance. Um, obviously, having a legal department uh, that's internally you know able to evict criminals. Uh, this is obviously a very important part of the business plan. In addition to that, Dr. Kolkan has uh, really uh, developed special relationships with the city and police departments that allows him to have direct communication with them uh, with regards to any complaints or criminal activity that may be at the site. And, you know, I'm sure you've heard it before, Dr. Kolkan. I don't need to, to tell you. But you know, the idea of being labeled as a slum lord, I mean, certainly, uh, you know, that comes with, you know, the 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 idea of, of acquiring these assets. And while we have the best intentions to turn around these communities, um, you know, it's it's important that we have substantial knowledge of the market. We have a qualified team. We have the liquidity to be able to pull these types of investments off. Otherwise, it's really seemed as a, uh, you know, trying to take advantage of this type of asset class. So, you know, it's important to really understand the mission of this and to trying to improve our communities. So with that, maybe we can go to the next screen, you know, and understanding that you know this is a, a arena in which experienced oper uh, operators have really thrived so maybe dr kokhan you can go a little bit into your process and how you've been able to sustain such you know continued growth throughout the years the thing is you and your team has to be very dedicated and very knowledgeable because you are dealing with the human being, you know. You need to know the psychology and uh, of the that area and how can you turn to this uh, neighborhood. First of all, you need to have very much knowledge about the materials and uh, how can you handle the uh, renovation process. Knowledge is, you know, you gain by the time and every day you learn the something and if like me, if you can do the, like eight projects and all of them very successful, and people, say, you know, start to trust you instead of the banks saying that you know, oh, this is dangerous. One day it might be repossessed, and so we have to manage this apartment. They say that look, it's very easy. You know, this Kalkan is succeeded so much, and he will succeed again. He knows very much, and he did it again, again, again. So reputation is extremely important here. And the spirit of the services, one point of the time, you should, you know, we don't think about the return. We think about that, okay, how, how are we gonna turn around to this neighborhood? Our motto is this, you know, I talk many times, you know, we like the, a lady, middle of the night, go to corner store and uh, grab a milk for his or her child, child without the worrying about the, her safety, can we achieve this one? Well, why not? I am in, I am able to do that in my neighborhood. Uh, I can walk anytime, middle of 3 a.m. I can walk and there is no crime. And we should be able to do this one. But why there is not being done? What is gone wrong? I don't know, honestly, but some point of the time, everything fall apart. Then we come, we want to straighten these things. But when we are doing, we want to use the, our knowledge. We want to do the cost effective way. When you give the bank, uh, we call the uh, capex, which is how much will it cost, you know, uh, all your repairs. When you say to the bank, look, I'm buying this property, $10 million, and I will spend the $2 million, which is $12 million, then this property will be $20 million worth. And you cannot go to bank and say that, okay, I thought about 2 million, but now it costs 4 million. 
No, it doesn't work that way. When you say something, your cost control, your efficiency has to be perfect. You have to be in your budget. To be able to control the budget, you need to have knowledge and experience. And if you join the, all these things, you know, knowledge is there and the good intentions there, reputation is there, and you are able to control the cost very well. Look, everything works very well. And this is unique investment opportunity. In the United States, there are many, many, many neighborhoods. Even police doesn't want to go there. 911 calls are not answered. Pizza man doesn't deliver the pizza. But investors can make the big difference. When they go there, they get the good return with no risk and no fluctuations. And it is the best thing you can accomplish. Is it easy? Look, if you have a great team, it is easy. Very easy for me. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kokan. Thank you, Dr. Oishi, for your insights into this topic. Um, you know, it's kind of a uh, summary. You know, Dr. Kokan has elaborated on his ability uh, to operate in terms of efficiency. And, you know, it takes a specific type of vendor to be able to execute on this type of business model. So, um, you know, Dr. Kokan has been able to, uh, you know, really kind of pursue a unique approach to his ability to manage these properties and therefore, you know, has been extremely successful. Uh, in his operation. So we appreciate you once again, Dr. Kokan, for joining us on this webinar. We'd like to take a moment to open it up to questions from some of our uh, participants that are on the call today. And I'd like to begin with a question with regards to, you know, the community impact. And, you know, basically one of the questions is, is talking about how you are a turnaround expert. Can you elaborate on the community impacts that you have seen in the properties that you've acquired and been able to turn around? Every property we bought, we reduced the you know, uh, crime rate very, very sharply, 90%. Uh, community impact, let me put this way, uh, when I go to neighborhoods, generally school buses don't stop there. And after one year operation, school bus enters to my apartment complex uh, to drop in the children. And uh, not only pizza and FedEx, in the community impact is that, you know, even school buses doesn't want to stop those neighborhoods. You know, they stood, uh, children needs to walk uh, two miles or as a group because school bus driver is scared of his life. Well, issue is, it might sound very dangerous or something. It is not actually. It is easy process. As long as you know, I find the money, equity to buy the property. I can keep doing this one again and again and again. For me, it is very very simple process. I can uh, success ratio. I can calculate the way that how many students in lives in my apartment. Uh, I have a one apartment complex. Uh, there was one bus uh, stopping uh, in front of the apartment complex. After one year operation, like a seven buses entering the apartment complex because the buses are full of those children from that apartment complex. That's amazing. I, and I, I have to say, Sahel, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I mean, this is one of the most uplifting uh, webinars I think we've ever done. Uh, you know, just the the idea that uh, with the combination of knowledge and know-how and heart, uh, you can really transform a, an entire community for the better and, and become a successful businessman while doing that. I think that's, that's something we all aspire to. Absolutely. And ultimately, I think that, that's the mission statement here is the ability to be able to turn around these communities. And, you know, as a person who's been able to drive out these the crime and other negative influence in these neighborhoods uh dr kokan do you ever feel like a uh you know personal threat or do you ever feel unsafe in your performance of your management duties never <laughs> never <laughs> i know that that's very the thing is that like this uh my uh you know, the thing, uh, let me put this way, 
uh, this American media is poisoned by the, you know, people are poisoned by the media. And the issue is they show that, you know, always constant drug dealers are shooting and killing the other people. They are so dangerous. I haven't observed that way. When somebody stand up, basically they just leave. They don't want to, nobody wants to go and fight with me because if they fight, look, I have a security company for, to protect me. A, the B is, why would they fight with me? They go to the next neighborhood or something, you know. They don't want to, who wants to uh, deal with the court? Okay? Have you ever heard about the drug dealer is defending himself against the landlord, you know? It never happens. Then I see that, you know, for example, one apartment complex, there are lots of the traffic. People are coming and going. I know that something is being delivered. I write a letter. Hey, sir, you have too much traffic. This is suspicious activity. I like to move out. And otherwise, I'm going to take you court. And next day, that person is not there. All my manager needs to put it is a letter there. You yeah. know, uh, those things, you know, we watch in the movies and the, uh, on TV, those are exceptional cases. I never seen it. Did I evict the people? Yes, I evicted. But the only thing is, I'm thinking that, you know, think about the school, uh, a classroom, uh, there is no teacher. Everybody is running around. But the issue is one or two people maybe is doing the mischief. When the class is in order, when the teacher is there, all the teacher needs to do is shows that she or he is in control. Okay, maybe there are one or two kids. You need to evict them. That's all. But uh, uh, I never worried about uh, somebody's taking revenge from me. And I'm feeling very comfortable and very relaxed. And uh, I want to do this work lifetime. Sure. Thank you. For, thank you for that response. And certainly your professorial background uh, really comes to light when you use an analogy of a, of a classroom and students there. So uh, we certainly understand that and, and thank you. So, you, you know, to that point, what, you know, the eviction prohibition that has been around, as you may, uh, as many of our viewers know, uh, not only in the state of Texas, but all across the country due to the pandemic, there has been an eviction on uh uh, there has been a prohibition on eviction for your tenants. Can you, and I'm sure that in class D and C assets that this is particularly of concern to you. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you're working with that right now? I can say that my tenants pay their rent and I don't have eviction problem. I don't want to evict anybody. They pay their rent because when there is a crisis hit, look, A class, uh, if the person at the living A class loses the job, they can go to B class. They can uh, go to lower level, and A class will have the vacancy issue. B class can go to C class. But if a person living in B class, where is going to go? That's the bottom. Okay? Everybody needs uh, those uh, apartments, and uh, those people generally work at the uh, uh, Walmart, uh, airport, or Amazon. Uh, I think that number one uh, uh, employer in my area is Amazon. Uh, and the uh, issue is, honestly, they are not able to find the employee, enough employee. There are lots of the work in this country, but uh, if you are a high paying job, that's a completely different story. But if you are, hand, you are a blue color uh, worker, that is always work. And uh, uh, that uh, moratorium is only for the, be careful about if somebody loses job, if he cannot pay the rent, but there is a government assistance. There is a state assistance. There is a county assistance. There is a city assistance. But if a person acts criminally, there is no moratorium. You can evict this person. If a person is on the bothering and harassing the other tenants or is not behaving nice, you know, you can evict it. There is no moratorium for every cases, except, uh, uh, if somebody loses their job, but the issue is, even if they lose job, uh, you know, there are lots of the support. Uh, I can say that last uh, six or seven months, you know, since there is a, this crisis, I don't recall that we evicting anybody or 
we need to evacuate. Right now, we are close to 100% occupied and all the tenants are paying their rents. Wow. No, that's, and I can echo that same sentiment. I mean, from our perspective, uh, I think that the media tends to sensationalize the idea of an eviction moratorium. But however, when you get into the practicality of it, you actually see very little uh, in terms of people that are actually you know, opting for this uh, for rental assistance. Now, certainly with your class of properties, I'm sure that's more important, but the fact that you have been able to get nearly 100% uh, rent collection as well as uh, occupancy, even during these uncertain times, I think is, is a credit to your ability to operate and manage these properties. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I know that we're kind of coming to the end here. Uh, we have just a couple of other questions uh, that have not been addressed thus far in the webinar that I'd like to uh, bring to your attention. So first and foremost, you know, Tom asked about how and, and specifically what was your strategy to get new tenants into these properties that already have a poor track record. So for example, if I go and Google some of these properties, as you'll notice, they'll have one or two stars. How are you able to overcome this and be able to restore occupancy in light of these negative reviews? Okay, let's say that uh, like this, uh, my properties, like 7,500, you don't see any advertisements, any advertisement. Let's look at the last four years, rent.com and other avenues. We never gave advertisements. Our motto is this, you treat your tenants very well, you know, they will uh, talk to their friends and their friends will come and the uh, word of the mouth is the most uh, effective leasing tool for us. You know, as long as I do good management, I have no problem leasing to my apartments. Uh, if one apartment complex, you know, you see that constantly giving advertisements and uh, uh, they are everywhere, you know, you need to ask them why they are giving the those advertisements, you know, the issue is there must be something wrong with their management style. Okay, when we buy apartment complex, how are we going to come? It's considered that we bought it. it's complete, uh, you know, problematic apartment complex. The thing is, when the tenant enters the office, he may, he, she immediately sees that this is a new management. We immediately change the office uh, furniture. We, dumped everything to trash and we started to paint outside. And the issue is, when do we start the painting outside? First week we buy apartment complex, you know. First week immediately they see that apartment being painted and furniture's changing in the office. And they see that there is a, some activities. And people, uh, there is a, some kind of the psychology that when the people pay the rent, they want to have this, a uh, lot of work for them. There is a, that kind of the psychology. Uh, when they see that you know we are doing something special always for them, they are happy. They think that we are taking care of them. And if they see the owner around, you know, inspecting their apartments, they like it more. You know, uh, we never have a problem leasing properties, regardless of the how bad it is. Understood. Understood. So you know really making these uh, cosmetic changes and indicating from for day one that the property is under new management and changing your style of communication with the tenants. Is that correct? That's kind of what you're... Yes. And I have the colorful, uh, very colorful. Uh, I make up. My, my apartments are always very colorful, you know. Uh, there are the some colors are our symbols, you know. Uh, First of all, when I bought to this apartment complex you sh uh, showed, I put a big banner, 12 feet, drug free uh -huh. apartment complex. We immediately, nobody is writing like this. So, 12 feet, drug free apartment. How can you write this one? Or oh, aren't there drug dealers? Aren't they going to take revenge or something? No, they just leave. That's all. Yeah. And, you know, you, make, you just show that neighborhood. You are different to owners. You just show that you are the new energy. You are changing the everything. I love it. And, and I know that you're kind of mentioning these 
uh, different processes and, uh, you know, types of things that you do. But, you know, really seeing the numbers and taking a deeper dive, we can see that everything that you're saying is absolutely true and the numbers prove them, right? And that, that's the beautiful thing about this, Dr. Kokan. Uh, so we really appreciate your insights. We have w one last question from Jeff here, uh, who is basically asking how you finance these purchases, what type of leverage you typically use, and do you have to provide a guarantee on these type of assets? If you don't mind answering those questions for us. Look, let me put this way. Generally, uh, the thing is that the real estate, the most important concept is leverage. You get the higher leverage loan so that you can buy the more apartment complexes. I love to get the 80% uh, LTV, but I have gotten the even 90%, 95% LTV loans. You know, sometimes I get very, very high. Uh, uh, last ones, I got 75% LTV. Interest rates, uh, majority of the, let me put this way, uh, let me reframe it. My uh, LTV is higher than the other investors. My interest rate is lower than the other investors. Most of the, my apartment complexes, I'm paying 1.9% interest rate. 1.9%. But wow. to be able to get those kind of interest rate, those kind of leverages, you have to prove yourself again and again and again. You know that's the way it is. You know you have to be very serious. Uh, this job, you can you know work with uh, some uh, uh, operator doing uh, doing this uh, job like through your company. You know um, market spread, they can invest it because uh, you are experienced company. By themselves, it is very hard to do. You have to be specialized, you know, and you have to be uh, 24 hours basically on your work, you know. Uh, I can say, uh, you know, close to, for future, near future, I think that I will borrow several hundred million dollars without any difficulty at all. Usually for the for the rest of us here, you know, fathoming several hundred millions of dollars is uh, seems like a dream, but here you're able to accomplish this. So it's, a, it's amazing what you've been able to, to do thus far. And congratulations to you, Dr. Kokan. The last question that I would like to leave you with here is from Yalsin. And he's asking, what is your one suggestion that you can give to investors who want to start in the class C and D uh, apartment business? What is your one suggestion that you can give? The thing is, let's separate the class C than the class D. Class C is work for housing, old and maintenance problems. Class D is completely neglected, forgotten apartment complexes and where the school bus doesn't go and that kind of things. Yeah. One suggestion, look, real estate made a bad name uh, because of the people uh, put their money and they forgot about it, especially Californian investors, and they treated uh, their apartment complex like a stock. Buy, price go up, sell. No, I don't believe that story. Look, you are dealing with a human being. Your tenants are depend on you. If you are investing in real estate, you need to consider that your tenants are like your children. You need to take care of them. You need to have that kind of determination that A, you work with the operator who knows what he's doing. Operator, very, very few management companies, if there is ever, they are specialized in the uh, D-class properties. If a management company says that I'm managing a class, B class, C class, and uh, 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 office, and also uh, uh, hotel. Forget about it. He cannot do this kind of work. He has to specialize only one class. You have to be laser sharp. In the United States, always uh, uh, concept is the diversification. Okay, do more diversification. Do diversification. My motto is completely different. No, 
don't do the, the versification. Just to be focused on the, what you are doing and do it better than the every single person. Do it the better than the everybody so that you turn around the neighborhoods and you know you get the pride of the, what you accomplished and you get very good returns. Absolutely. I mean, it's not only about the profitability component but you're actually you know, doing your civic duty by improving these neighborhoods. So thank you, Dr. Kulkan. Uh, Dr. Oishi, I'll leave it to you with some last thoughts before I, I, I finish up here for the evening. I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, I mean, I'm on the verge of tears here because this has been <laughs> such an amazing and, and uplifting experience listening to Dr. Kulkan. Uh, I don't think we've ever had a, a, a webcast quite like this. Uh, I, I really do appreciate uh, your being here, Dr. Kalkan. It's it's been a tremendous honor to uh, to share this webcast with you. Absolutely. I thank you both of you giving the opportunity uh, to talking in your webcast. I appreciate very much. I thank you very much, and I thank the market space capital. Thank, Thank you. you, Dr. Thank Kulkan. You. We really appreciate you. Everyone out in the audience, we appreciate your insightful questions. Uh, and once again, special day thanks to Dr. Kulkan for being here today and helping us understand, uh, you know, the Class C and D apartment assets. And we really appreciate your insights as they truly were invaluable. Uh, once again, we appreciate you all taking the time to join us. And on behalf of Market Space Capital. We thank you and wish you a good evening. Bye-bye.